Oh hey, before we get going, if you're wondering where the How Not to Bernie is this week, it's over on Fan and Frenzy. There's an annotation, there's a link in the description, and there's also the easiest way is to go to the How Not to Bernie list. That is the third playlist down on the channel. How rude, shilling How Not to Bernie for King of Limbo. You might think so, Jeff, but this guest said he spent a day marathoning How Not to Bernie before coming on. Hey guys, it's FNGR. Sometimes I have a chance to give thanks to an artist who drew my OC, like Seiju the Skunk, or Grey Silverman, he draws me enough art to likely be worth over a K by now, and if not, maybe in so many years. This week we talked to Sean Howell, aka King Cheetah. I looked at this man's porn, like a lot of it. I'd like to apologize because I'm not one of those guys who won't shut up about that sort of thing. You used to be on the pony fuck caster. Shut the fuck up, Jeff. Anywho, this man has been with the fandom since 2012. And he's a fan of How Not to Brony. That likely means there's going to be some juicy stuff on this podcast. Yes, yes, there is. Alternatively, if you're familiar with Antarctic Press or Radio Comics, Sean's done some work there. And he's even drawn from my favorite comic, Ninja High. So yeah, comic books, drama, brony. Not to mention, we had on Young Blood Fantasy 91, Kichi FIM, Grey Silvermane, and Sam Lion, who I kind of forgot to add at first. Which is a massive dick move, because I only got to talk to Sean because of Sam. By the way, Sammy has been coloring in many of Sean's picks, so you should go check out both of their deviant arts. If you're a furry and you don't know who Sean is, shame on you. And we're going to get that fixed. But if you do know Sean, enjoy. See you soon. Does it sound good, Kichi? Yes, you okay. sound better. <clears throat> Where the hell? I'm gonna panic attack if I lost the questions, Jesus. So anyway, Digibrony and I broke up, but it was amicable, and uh, I let him keep the cats. Aw, you broke up with Digibrony? So, you're, you're cookie cutter. I, I always suspected. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Plot twist. <laughs> but no, seriously, as far as Hobbs goes, I was gonna try and keep these all furry related, at least to a point here. You've... And- you... Out, Digi was actually Tommy Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you've worked on various platforms from DA to Fur Affinity to Radio Comics um, and then briefly Disney. Uh, what would you say their pros and cons are? Well, I mean, Radio Comics is a different thing than Fur Affinity or anything. Mm-hmm. And let me emphasize, my Disney job was a pickup art job that I did to make my father happy. You know, he, I won't say he was supportive of me being an artist, but he never got in the way. Being a sort of casual the way he was, when you talk about doing cartoons and comics, he, he knows Disney. And he was okay with that. So he was always on me to get a job at Disney, not understanding what you know, working for Disney actually means. So back in the 90s, I got a small pickup art job so that I could have an honest-to-goodness Disney check stub to show him. And it turns out he was under the the misguided notion that if you worked for Disney in any capacity, you got free park passes. <laughs> so that that's okay. what that, that was what that was all about. Is like if I don't get free park pass, like no pops. Radio comics. The first of his Antarctic Press, mm-hmm. and that was back in the 90s when it was really, that was a good time to work in comics. Comics were really booming, particularly manga was taken off, you could do adult comics, there was a thriving independent comic market, it wasn't all superheroes, and so there was a lot of books, the economy was going up, so a lot of people had a lot of disposable income to buy comics. Basically, it was, it was a good 10 years. But Antarctic Press changed its business model, let a lot of us go, but uh, kind of with a golden parachute. And Ellen Winkler took her part of it and formed Radio Comics. And, And Antarctic Press gave her a bunch of the old books that they had been publishing so that she could pick them up, which is where she got all the furry titles, all the adult titles, all the manga titles, and just proceeded from there. But in the intervening years, the comic market has changed and tightened up and gotten really kind of shitty. So that's, that's why I don't have a lot of truck with it anymore, because it's, it's just not what it was. It's very difficult to do independent comics now, which is why, you know, so many comic guys just do Patreon and Kickstarter, because it's a lot easier than trying to fool, not so much with publishers, but with the distributor Diamond. I wanted to ask about this with the different things becoming uh, regulated and deregulated in comics. Were there any, like, major moments where things just became a lot easier or unbearable? Back 
in the 90s, we used to have two major comic distributors, and that was Capital City and Diamond. And they kind of kept each other in check. Diamond liked Cape Comics, whereas Capital City liked independent comics and manga and furry books. So sometime, I think about 96, Capital City went belly up, and that left just one major comic distributor, which was Diamond. And since Diamond had a monopoly, it started behaving like monopolies do and started instituting a lot of rules and they decided they didn't want to carry a lot of types of books. And, you know, things just got grim since then. The uh, comic market is only a fraction of what it used to be, which is funny because superheroes and everything are very popular, yet comics are at their lowest sales numbers they've ever known. And it's just because well, first off, comics on the shelves are not anything like the comic book movies, and everybody seems to like the movies and the cartoons, those always do fine, but the comics themselves are kind of grim, dark, and strident, so they just don't sell as well. Hobbs, did you have any questions before I run you over? Uh, well, right now, I'm just trying to think of the appropriate questions. Well, here, I'll, I'll, I'll try, and maybe he'll know some of these titles. You've worked on comics like, uh, I think, Furlong and uh, Guinness. Are there some other titles that you think were, uh, what, was, what were the more tame titles that you worked for? Rather than ask questions, why don't we just talk? Okay. Hmm. What do you want to talk about? Well, the, um, the various titles were just mostly to, uh, back in the 90s, were just to kind of feel people out and see what they wanted. So, Ben... Ben Dunn initially created Furlough, which was a military furry book, because he really liked Albedo, Steve Galachi's Albedo comic. I was really scared to ask you, and I was like, when you said Antarctic Press, I was like, I wonder if he knows Ben Dunn in Ninja High. Ben Ninja High School. Oh. I'm editing, I'm in a bunch of the books. It's no big thing. Well, this ben to me, sir. <laughs> it's a good thing. Yeah. Um, but anyway, after that, we created uh, Genus, which was an adult title. Mm-hmm. And Wildlife, which was just sort of a slice of life comedy title, and Hit the Beach, which was a swimsuit issue, because swimsuits were really big back in the early 90s. Uh, a lot of the companies like Marvel and Image were doing swimsuit issues. So that was just a thing back then. But after a while, we began to get a handle on the market, and it's like, well, you really don't need those divisions. You could just do a furry book and just put stories and stuff in it. The, um, the thing is now, you don't really need furry comics because back then, furry was a relatively new thing, as was anime. Mm -hmm. Anime is almost unknown in the 80s except to a small hardcore group. And in the 90s, it started growing until it got really huge towards the end in both anime and manga. Well, furries were the same way. And as you get more and more mainstream, and furry is very mainstream now. You just you don't need specialized books anymore because you can go anywhere on the internet and find the art. You know, we have what twenty furry image boards now. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's furry network and so furry, gift star and furry <clears throat> Family and weasel and ink bunny. Ink bunny. Ink ink bunny. Yeah, I was thinking that. Uh, I, so, I know one of those things. DA. <laughs> I, tend to, I tend to lurk on a for affinity, and then I'm like, but then, you know, my partner is like, no, you should hang out on an ink bunny, it's better. So I'm just like, <laughs> comparatively speaking. Yeah, I need to start uh, re-uploading stuff to for affinity, because so far it's just my old stuff. Yeah, I mean, I upload both my, you know, all of my music compositions, because I can't draw worth crap, but, <laughs> but yeah, like, what do you think about that? Like, what do you think uh, there are better platforms for, um, you know, distributing furry stuff online? Because I've heard a lot of people like bash for affinity on the forums and other places, and there's a lot of drama associated with that, as, as I'm sure you're well aware. Her affinity is that girlfriend that you hate, but she's better than not having someone. Mm. That's mm. really what it boils down to. It's like people put up with fur affinity because it's been there the longest and it's kind of comfortable, but everyone agrees it's horribly run, it's horribly coded, but it's just that's where everybody is. And until there's another major outage, everybody doesn't feel the need to really jump ship. I mean, and a couple of the other image boards have tried to capitalize on this. Weasel tried to Skype. Huh? It's kind of like Skype. <laughs> or even YouTube, because YouTube cornered yeah. that market, and for Affinity seemed to corner the market of, you know, posting images and art and what have you. Just by longevity. Yeah. The second thing is, I, um, 
I joined Fur Affinity in 2005 when it first started. My member number was 50. And in, in those days, it used to have a bunch of features we don't have anymore, which is a shame. It had individual chat rooms. And you could create all of these other little side rooms and stuff to RP in and things like that. And that was all great. And they got rid of those features. And uh, sometime in 2007, they promised us essentially the interface we have now. But as you see, it's taken them almost 10 years to institute it. Yeah. It's, it's hacked constantly because the coding is so bad. Now, I'm not even going to get into the bizarre drama, mostly because it's not that interesting. It's like, all you need to know is the guy who runs it is an idiot and a drama queen. And that's that's the long and the short of it. Yes. It doesn't get much more interesting than that. However, there is a uh, message board called Vivisector that if you're interested in the drama of Fur Affinity, you can go there and... <laughs> Sign up. That's an appropriate title, <laughs> Vivisector. Oh, yeah. And it covers all the furry drama. But that's the thing. It's that now you, you look at Twitter and to a lesser degree, Tumblr. And that's funny because I was just talking to a Goody Rex about this 20 minutes ago. That people are sort of spreading themselves out, but nobody has found that perfect image board anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, DeviantArt used to be a thing. I mean, it was riding high in like 2009. Even the biggest names in animation and uh, the comics world had DeviantArt pages, and now it's a ghost town. Oh, uh, Sean, I don't mean to be a dick or anything like this. Uh, is your Skype set to D&D? &D? Because I'm hearing a lot of update sounds. Is that somebody else? I think, uh, that's, I think that's Hobbs. Are you playing an instrument? Nah, dude, I'm not. I'm on D&D. &D. Oh, because when I updated, oh. I heard a dink. I, I thought it was... Yeah, I, I heard it there again. Like a, I'm positive. I'm not doing anything. Oh, it ain't oh no, it stopped. No, that's fixed now. All right, never mind. Go ahead. Funny Go ahead. when you met, you mentioned for Affinity. It's funny that you said you mentioned 2005 because I mean it's it's parallels YouTube because YouTube was founded in 2005 and they also had specialized um, streaming places you can go to. Some of them even were dedicated for role playing. I distinctly remember them testing out streams between 2007 and 2009, and you could like go in there. You can even limit the number of people that came in there. It was pretty interesting. And then, you know, I don't know if there was a lot of drama associated with the heads of YouTube, but I can tell you that, you know, it's similar. It's a, there's a lot of mismanagement going on. Uh, I, I believe is in the way of these things, the original guy who created it later sold it. And it's it, that always seems to be the way that somebody creates something. It works just fine. They sell it off. And then the new guys make all kinds of weird changes. Mm -hmm. Very true. I'll give you a quick primer on the history of Fur Affinity. Yeah, that'd be great. Mm. Back in the day, DeviantArt used to be a different thing in 2003, all right? So it was just starting off. In fact, it was it was much more like Fortune because it was sort of an image board rather than being a website. But they had all kinds of rules and, you know, you had a guy running it who was kind of a tight ass. So these two guys break off from it and they form a thing called Sheezy Art. And it was supposed to be eating art without the rules. Okay. And a lot mm. of people gravitated there. And that was where I met most of my friends in the art world. So like Poinko and Goody Rex and well, just all these guys. It turns out the guys running the board were thirteen years old and there was a lot of porn. Well, okay, not porn, adult art. And somebody pointed this out to them, but it's like, if your IP provider finds out your underage guys are hosting adult art, they're, they're going to shut you down. Okay, now if you're an adult, you think these things through, and it's like, all right, we're in a hard spot, but if we just approach the members and tell them, they'll understand and work with us. That's not how 13-year-olds think. Mm -hmm. So it came to light that these guys were planning on just deleting all of the adult material as a fait accompli and just telling everybody, well, when this leaked out, everybody went apeshit. And there was a mass exodus of artists from Sheezy Art. And now the site is shut down now, but for the longest time, you could sign into it and it was frozen in time. It was these huge swaths of pages that had all just stopped at the same moment in 2005 with updates. Well, at almost the same moment, I was talking to some other people and they said, well, this new image board has been set up called Fur Affinity, why don't you try that? 
And that's where most of us went, because despite it being called Fur Affinity, you can actually post anything there you wanted. There was no strictures on human stuff or anything like that. It was pretty freewheeling, which is a big reason why Fur Affinity grew initially, is because there were no restrictions. You could post whatever you wanted, and a lot of people really appreciate it. And eh, let's see, I guess about 2007 is when the drama happened between the mods and there was split in the groups and one group went off and they were going to do their thing and that never happened and Dragoneer just continued to run for Affinity. Oh boy. That's what lost a lot of the features like the chat rooms and stuff is during the split. But, uh, and just essentially he's just bobbed along because he was the thing and if you think about it, you know, we got YouTube and, and DeviantArt. Oh, well, the funny thing is DeviantArt at almost the same time kicked out the tight ass moderator and loosened up all the rules so all of a sudden DeviantArt became the site everybody liked cheesy art for so it started growing again and that was when uh, it became ridiculously huge but then it got a new bunch of mods in I think 2011 and that's when they started just constantly tinkering with everything and putting rules in and trying to optimize the site so you could look at it on your phone and I don't know. A lot of people bailed about that time just because uh, DeviantArt became difficult to use, more of a hassle than it would for it. All the pages are still there, though, unless you made a, uh, a point of deactivating your page. You know, Craig McCracken's page is still there. Lauren Faust's page is still there. Oh, man, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Sipsy's page is still there. Rebecca Sugar's page is still there. That's a funny thing. Craig's page, this was in 2000. 10, he was talking to us about Wander Over Yonder. This is years before he pitched it to Disney, but he's like, I got this idea for this thing, and he was showing us all of his concept drawings for it, and, you know, just sort of laying out his plans. And Lauren used to answer questions about ponies on DeviantArt constantly. He just send her a private message or give her a shout on her front page and she was very gracious found out a lot of a lot of stuff about the show just because people got interested in what would ask her specific things and and she was more than happy to fill in the details yeah there's that human element because most artists seem to be these remote inaccessible you know figures that seem to have influenced a lot of people and you, and you know, most people treat him like royalty. Oh my God, my dogs are barking. Treat him like royalty though. But with that human element, you know, I find that to be very fascinating. I forgot to add Sam to this call. I felt like a giant asshole. So like, do you think, so <laughs> being that you have been an artist for decades, you know, my, my idea would be, or my question would be in that case would be like, do you think it would be a good idea to have that human element to constantly interact with people through the media that you use? Or would you say to back off and just, you know, let them speak on their, and just keep that remote? Because there's some people who actually are polarized by that. Some people say, definitely do that. Other people say, don't bother. So My gut instinct would say, continue to do that. But unfortunately, the past couple of years, we've had several incidents that have really caused uh, the studios and the creators to become gun shy about this. And it's, you know, Hasbro was really okay with the creators talking to the fans for a while there until the writers started getting death threats because of Flash Sentry. And uh, that's not an exaggeration. And you, ha I, you can understand it that a fan gets upset and blurts something out on Twitter, but it's like, I, you understand Hasbro is responsible for these people if they go to a con and you get some idiot spurred lord that feels rainbow dashes and being treated right and then throws a cup of urine on somebody it, you know they're not going to take that liability well, and sean you might know this one i heard back in the day that tiny tunes got canceled because some crazy furry stopped like stalked the va who was, did babs or something like that no, uh, no i think he stuck uh, stalked uh, cat sauce she played fifi <laughs> uh well she did get stalked but that's not why the show was canceled the show got canceled because it ran its course Warner Brothers in those days didn't want to double up stuff, and they ran Tiny Toons out because it, you have to have a certain number, well, in those days, you had to have a certain number of episodes in the can in order to do a syndication pack. Yeah, like three seasons. Yeah. Uh, usually 72, uh, Disney had slightly different numbers, but they went ahead and finished it, and they are like, okay, we're done with this, we're going to do Animaniacs. Though, uh, first they did, um, oh no, they did, they did Animaniacs, and then they did Freakazoid. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one. <laughs> it, it, it's the one shows overlapping uh, to a certain degree because you have an A show and a B show at Warner Brothers. So your A show 
is Animaniacs, your B show is Tasmania. And and so they would just go along like that. But no, I, you're half right. Yes, she was being stalked, but no, that wasn't the reason the show got. It just ran its course. And the same thing with the Disney shows. It's like DuckTales and Tailspin and Darkwing Duck all had good long runs. And they just ran their course and uh, Disney was ready to try something else. Because you, you don't want a show to keep running till it goes sour. And I'm looking at you, Kim Possible. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. <laughs> Very relatable. <laughs> You always have that danger that you have a hit show and you just keep going too long and it, it becomes meta and self-referential and the fans get bored with it. And it's like, no, you want to, you always want to go out on a high note. Well, well, Sean, on that note, and I'm going to try and get you in trouble here. Do you feel that MLP has hit that note yet? Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> oh, what season? If you go back and look at the history of Hasbro as a organization, it has had these properties forever, since the 80s. Mm -hmm. And they're run for several seasons. Property mess. It's what they always do. So you've had several iterations through the 90s of Transformers mm -hmm. and of G.I. Joe. And you let it go, and then you rest it because you, you want to keep the brand fresh. Now, They've never known success the way they have with the Lauren Faust, My Little Pony. Friendship at Magic has just boggled them how well it did, and that's why they keep going with it. But, you know, you run that prob uh, that risk of just wearing it out. Now, normally, they wouldn't even have done a season five. If you, if you look at uh, Hasbro's past track record, they would have done four seasons and then a movie, and then it's like, okay, we're going to put this to sleep for a while. And then, you know, about next year would be when they would be reintroduced by Little Pony. It, it would probably be a new look, probably a little flash animation, a, a different ethic to it. I mean, what's like when The Hub started in 2010, their, um, their Transformer show was Transformer Prime, which was pretty good. And it ran, I think, three seasons. Yeah, it did. Yeah, and then they let it rest, and then they introduced Rescue Heroes. And that's the new Transformers now. And eventually, probably this year, Rescue Heroes will finish up, they'll wait a couple of years, and they'll introduce the next Transformers. Actually, they already did. It was uh, Transformers Robots in Disguise. Okay, so they... It was the, con it was the continuation of uh, Prime. Mm. And I enjoyed that with Ben 10 too. Not really a Transformer guy, but I really enjoyed Brian. That was that was very well written. Not to mention the fact that Hasbro has all these other properties they would likewise get like to get going, uh, like Strawberry Shortcake and Rainbow Bright and Care Bears and like half a dozen others. Um, I can't remember which of the shows. It's not the Shirt Tales, but they actually own one of the furry animal shows from the eighties. Uh, the Bubbles. No, Popples is Disney. No, okay. wait. That was the Wuzzles. Oh, okay. They, they own one of those. It, it, they did that, uh, the CGI uh, Popples, and I thought that this was uh, Hasbro. No, you're, you're correct. They, they do own Popples, but I was thinking of uh, not Get Along Gang, because that's American Greetings. Okay. Uh, okay. Shirt Tales. They own Shirt Tales. And there's been talk about trying to bring that back because, you know, because Zootopia got the Oscar, now all of a sudden furry cartoons have a little heat to them. So they're a little more amenable to looking at proposals for bringing back furry shows. I mean, hell, that's why we got the Battleship movie is just Hasbro has all these things they want to try and they'll see what sticks. Personally, I would like to see the modern iteration of Tiny Toons. Well... That's not out of the realm of possibility. Warner Brothers is in kind of a weird place now because they don't have a studio anymore like they used to. They used to have an in-house animation thing. Now they just pick up shows, you know, so they right. don't make cartoons like they used to. So that's a little trickier. You saw, for example, the Kickstarter to bring back SWAT Cats. Now, I, yeah. had a, I had a lot of problems with how that Kickstarter was run, but you run into the problem that the guys doing it say, okay, we're going to pitch this to a network. It's like, God, that's not how things go anymore. You know, if you think about it, what network is going to pick it up? Like Cartoon Network, it's not going to take SWAT cats. That's not the kind of show they're doing right now. You don't have Turner like you used to, so TBS is not going to pick 
it out. It's neat stuff. And you don't have network uh, porting cartoons like you used to. So it's like, these guys didn't really think it through. It's like, okay, you can do a series and put it up on iTunes or Netflix or Amazon. That's fine. But that's not the, the entire way they set up the Kickstarter was about, you pay us to create the design sheets and the Bible and we'll shop it around in networks. Well, okay, it's going to fail because that's just not the way things run now. Not to mention the fact that in their uh, the little bits of design art they did start putting out, I, I really started cringing that this is going to have way too many modern sensibilities to it. So it's like, yeah, no thanks. So the cynicism really is setting in, eh? <laughs> well, I mean, I have a problem with if you insist on doing nostalgia stuff, which I'm not a big fan of. It's like, if you love something, just leave it in the past, look at it and decide, why did I love this? And then create something based off of that. Like, okay, what is it about this show that really appealed to me? That and create a new thing. I name one of these reboots that has been really good outside of ponies. Oh, I'm looking forward to Samurai Jack. Yeah, uh, yeah I, that's not out yet. But though. that's more of a continuation. Yeah, uh, 13 years, I don't know, man. I'm willing to give him that. Well, it's, as a reboot. well, it's <laughs> season five, not season one. True. Yeah, and bringing back as much of the crew as they can. So that that's not the same thing as, say, the new Powerpuff Girls was. Yeah. I'd, say the, was I'd, say the, um, I'd say the Ninja Turtles reboot was pretty decent. Oh, yeah, that was fun. Okay, but that's not a reboot per se. And it, now, Turtles is a fascinating example because Turtles unlike a lot of these things, has a base material, and that's the comics. The interesting thing is about all of the versions, it's like they all have to, well, not have to, but they all choose to go back to the base material for everything they do. It's just how they handle it from there. Now, the newest version of Turtles is brilliant, despite Beast Boy being one of the voices. It was, the, the animation's really good, it's a very stylish CGI, hits all the high points, makes a few changes, but all of the important elements about what makes Turtles Turtles is there. Okay, so the creators got it. They understood why people love this. And that's the funny thing, is that over the years, you've had several reboots of the Turtles as cartoons, and every single one of them has done pretty well. Actually, my favorite is the 2D animation version we had before this one, because it was the most faithful to the comic. And they did a really good job on it. I'd say I'm looking forward to the DuckTales reboot. I'm cautiously optimistic. We'll see what happens. I'm hoping it's good. I'll, I'll put it that way. <laughs> well, I'd say I, I'd say I like what I saw so far. Yeah. Uh, the, I'm hoping that's good. Hoping, even though Samurai Jack is not a technically not a reboot, I'm gonna count it as one because it's been so so long. Mm -hmm. They I'm could still... have they <laughs> could have brought it back and made it yeah. terrible. So. Yeah. See, the problem is, Powerpuff Girls and Dexter's Lab, the first time around, were a prime example of not letting cartoons go too long. Because in both cases, you hit a perfect point to end it, and that was when each got a movie. Yep. And then they insisted on doing more after that, and all the fans agreed. It's like, those episodes just weren't as good, because by that time... All of the initial creators and people working on it had moved on to new projects. And, and so the fans themselves had moved on. Mm. Yeah, you kind of, it's this ghost thing. So, you know, sitting through seasons three and four of Dexter's Lab is kind of painful when you look at seasons one and two because they're so good. And the same with Powerpuff Girls. All of the episodes that came after the Powerpuff Girl movie were just sort of also rants. And it's like nobody looks back fondly on those, they remember all the really good stuff from the pre-movie. Powerpuff Girls movie was solid. Mm -hmm. I yeah. Agree. They did a good job, took their time with it, didn't rush it out, and it, it showed. Yeah, I, I went back and watched it, like, maybe a few weeks ago, and I, I still enjoy it, which it's not something I can say about a lot of <laughs> movies from back then. Well, and, you know, again, you always have to keep stuff in its historical context because on an image board that'll remain nameless <laughs> and about in the animated series, and a lot of the young guys were like, I don't see the appeal. I like Brave and Bold better. And it's like, no, you don't understand. At the time in the early 90s when BTAS hit, there had never been anything like this before. This was new. It was fresh. It was mm -hmm old writing, the art deco look, and the sharp animation. It's like, yes, 
a lot of people have learned from that and emulated it in the years since. But at that time, this that's why it ran for 10 years, is because this thing was just the hawk among the sparrows. And that's not to say these subsequent Batman shows haven't been good, but it's just, okay, that one went off like a bomb. Did, did you ever hear about, um, I believe it's uh, Mark Hamill's thing when he went in and he tried out and he's like, I sure hope I don't screw up the Joker. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's it's really funny <laughs> the the guy interviewing him right afterwards is like you know that people consider you the gold standard now. <laughs> Whenever you had to do an a, an evil clown character in another cartoon, they always got Mark Hamill. Yeah, <laughs> and you know Timo Supreme and all these other ones like oh, we gotta get Mark Hamill on board with this. Likewise, if you had a pirate, you had to get Tim Curry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Always with that swashbuckling guy. Oh, he's good. I need he's more really tweet. I need more ventilated. tweets. I need more tweets of Mark Hamill reading the Joker's lines. Reading freaking but- Donald Trump's tweets as the Joker. I need more of those. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Everybody, for the most part, has bowed out kind of gracefully because most of the uh, the VAs from those years are are still around. But it's like Mark is kind of accepted. It's like, yeah, it's a different age now. I need want to do something else, and not insist on being the Joker, which is cool. You got to have that class. Looking at uh, the new pilots for cartoons, I, there's stuff I like, but I don't know where they go with it. Do you guys? Did you guys see the pilot for Mystery Train? Yes, yep. and that's yes. Very interesting. Very cool. It reminded me of of what Adventure Time was like when it first started out, but I honestly don't know where they'd go with it. It's like, uh, okay, so... Oh, that could, that could be a good thing. Yeah, I, I don't know that if they got picked up or not, but it's like, wow, that's, that's kind of tricky. Uh, same thing with... There was this Flash cartoon... God, I guess that was about seven, eight years ago now, that everybody on uh, the Chons was always talking about that was kind of steampunky and had a, a really sharp flash style. Megas then, XLR? No, not Megas. Uh, Me- the Adventures of Screw on Head? No, it was... Uh, God, that was beautiful. She had a real pink motif, but she could instantaneously change into other characters. And, uh, crap, I just cannot remember the name of this thing. Well, basically, it looked good as a pilot, but it's like, okay, so how do you do this for 24 episodes? I mean, you, you've shown us a gimmick, you now. what are you going to go with this? What, what, what are the stories going to be like? Because that's always the tricky thing. When you, when you do a pilot, it's like, okay, make sure you've got some place to head with this. And that is why I really respect Gravity Falls, is that Hirsch, he had a story, and it was one and done. And he was riding high, and if he wanted to, he could have kept going with Gravity Falls, but he's like, no, this is the story I wanted to tell, and now I'm going to go do something else. He went out on a high note, he kept it fresh, and the fans are still pretty loyal about it. Yeah, that was uh, probably one of the best parts about Gravity Falls. It was as it was a whole story. A uh, personal vision. He knew where it was going, and it, that's the beauty of it. Because he knew where it was going, that gave him a chance to craft everything. All the little clues and ciphers and stuff he put throughout it. Remember, for in the first season, every time you hear the whisper at the end of the opening credits, <laughs> people were recording that and putting it back. It's like, okay, what does this mean? I would hope more people would kind of pick up on that. You know, oh, well, but to um, I want to go back on something uh, we touched on briefly earlier, and that is toxic fandoms. Oh yes. Well, it's a disappointing thing, but you know, you can't really lay that at the network or the creator's feet. I was going to say something that might upset you. Don't take this the wrong way. I think you will. You remind me of Tinker. Oh no. Uh, what I mean by that is it when I had her on, I didn't have to ask any questions. I just okay. gave her airtime, and she talked, and it was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> The, the thing is with toxic fandom stuff is it detracts from the show overall. Now, I'll give you two good examples. I had no part in this, but apparently when I wasn't paying attention, Invader Zim fandom just became a terror. You know, terrorized the creator, terrorized the networks, fought with each other. You know, the... If you're on the Chons, you know they won't shut up about Homestuck fans. Oh, goodness. Yeah, and I don't even need to get into the Steven Universe mm-hmm. fan. 
which is a shame because it's like it's, it's not my good. thing but steven universe is a good solid show it's well done has very talented people mm -hmm. working on it but many people are put off because it's like i do not want to be associated with these fans you know so you literally have people that will tell you in secret it's like well don't let this get around but i like steven <laughs> well, i feel like i've been to that camp actually <laughs> Me too. It, it, you know, I watched all of the first season. It's like, no, oh, it's just. A, but it, the fact that you do have people who genuinely enjoy the show but are afraid to say so is sad. Yeah, I mean, something similar happened with stuff like the original NGE and Naruto, even. Oh yeah, true. But anime fandom has a lot of that. That just for whatever reason, these shows resonate with a group and just set them off. Very polarizing. Uh, yeah, I guess polarizing. See, earlier, well, it's weird to say, earlier in the century, you had shows like A. Arnold and Teen Titans that both got massive fandoms. I mean, these were very, very popular shows. And yet, for the most part, their fans were pretty well behaved. Nobody doing anything stupid. There wasn't too much infighting. I can't think of any real weird blow-ups at conventions or anything. But just somewhere along the line, you know, people just started misbehaving. It's, it's okay if folks like something you don't like and vice versa. Hey, I don't expect everybody to like ponies. I know why I like ponies. That's that's good enough for me. But yeah, you end it. Sort of like a weird group think mentality. It's like if you're either with us or, or you're against us. And then... Well, when you hear the story of somebody being kicked off the staff of Steven Universe for showing insufficient faith in body types, you know, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's politics, but... Mm. Well, yeah, but, you know, you shouldn't you shouldn't bully people for their taste. I mean, if, if you think somebody's a knob, just don't hang around with them. You don't have to go after them, and especially when it's stuff like shipping or I don't like the way you drew that character. It's like, come on, lighten up. Uh, well, how often do you get that, Sean? Oh, plenty of times, but you see, that's <laughs> like about fan art even when it's uh when phil and i were doing cantrip the magic rabbit we got a lot of fan art and i'd love to see all the ways different artists would handle it because it's boring if if somebody just tried to copy phil's style but you see them drawing our characters in their style that's really cool and that's what you know you talk to the creators of a lot of these shows you talk to rebecca sugar she loves it when people just go nuts drawing her characters their way. It's both flattering and interesting to see how people handle it. You know, so I've, I've never never had a, a lot of trouble on model. I know I'm late to the call, but Sean, it's nice nice to meet you tonight. Um, your um, colors for the past couple of weeks, and I do appreciate you letting me color your work. Oh, yeah, that was horrible, Sam. I have to apologize to you. I was like, I feel like I'm missing someone. Oh, yeah, the guy who put me in touch with the guest. I am a giant asshole. I am the worst human being ever. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, it's, it's cool. It's cool, man. I'm glad you brought me in when you did. Excellent. I, I was going to probably go underneath KP for <laughs> least reliable <laughs> person possible. Have any horror stories about her, Sean? <laughs> oh, dear lord. <laughs> uh, see, I don't I don't follow a lot of that. I have other drama I've known about, but the thing is, it's like, okay, this deals with stuff that's in the past, people you don't know, so I can't I can't explain to you why it would be important to care. I've, I've heard enough stories. I've talked to enough old-timers like Cal Payne from EQD, or Seth, or Tinker, or Draft. Don't you mention that you knew something about a uh, Everfree Network? Oh yeah. Okay. Like oh Jesus! I could have got Neil X for you. He probably would have known you. Like I told you, I started in pony fandom before the hub was an app. For whatever reason, the pilot was out on the internet before the hub launched as an app. So the My Little Pony pilot's out there, and somebody on Fur Affinity posted an animated GIF of the main six galloping. It's the scene where they're galloping towards the manor. And yeah. I was like, wow, this animation is really impressive. So I went ahead and I uh, I think I got it off of Rapid Share or maybe Mediafire, found it, and I watched it. I was amazed. And that was when on 4chan in uh, Co, they started having these constant threads. Like, have you guys seen this thing? It's really impressive. And then the hub launches, and we start getting the real episodes, and it just grows and grows and grows from there. I was telling uh, telling your host here mm -hmm. that uh, somewhere I have a screen cap of Sophisto mm -hmm. in uh, 2010 on Fortran saying, I'm thinking about starting this Pony News website. What do you guys think? Should I do this? Oh, boy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Also, inter also interesting fact, the, that GIF you mentioned, 
that was actually one of one of the two things that got me into the show. Although I came in a bit later, I think it was around the winter wrap up. I was I was actually I actually watched this for two reasons. I was interested what were all the names of the cross-eyed Pegasus and why was the pink one in the galloping scene skipping? Yes, the uh, and, and that was the beauty of the show. I mean, it was Lauren's vision. But the the thing that really gets you is unlike a lot of shows. All right, and all right, when the Hub first started airing Ponies, it would run the Strawberry Shortcake cartoon just before MLP. Now, it's interesting because on paper, the two shows are identical about a group of friends, multicolored friends, who have to deal with problems. And yet, Strawberry Shortcake tasted of ass. (laughs) Oh, Lord. Well, it's because Lauren understood she was not making a girl show. She was making a show that would appeal to girls. And there is a difference. Yeah. She made a show that anyone could enjoy but would appeal to girls because all of the girls in it are male girls, including the fact that even though they're friends, sometimes they get on each other's nerves, sometimes they're competitive, you know, sometimes they have fights, sometimes they get short with each other. And it's like, okay, this is the most realistic representation of being a kid I've ever seen in a cartoon. Whereas Charberry Shortcake was a lot of giggling, a lot of pastel colors. It was, in short, too girly. And that's why, you know, people outside the fandom don't understand the appeal of ponies. It's like, it's because it was a step beyond the usual kind of cartoons. And it's like I was saying about BTAS. It's like, okay, a lot of people have picked up on this now, but at the time, 2010, we hadn't had a cartoon like this before. So it really was kind of breaking new ground in the writing and the characters, and the characters were all really interesting. You know, it took almost no time to realize that Rainbow Dash is worst pony. And you had all the... (laughs) (laughs) I think I'm going to need a soundbite of that. 20% cooler? Nah, bro. It's a weird way to say apple horse, but go on. (laughs) <laughs> oh, have an entire episode that could be titled All of My Friends Are Ungrateful Bitches. You know, you know you really got something. And that is an amazing episode. Oh, you mean the rarity one? Yes, because it's like, oh my god. And yet it showed that, okay, that's very realistic because sometimes your friends do act like knobs, but you learn to get over it because they're your friends. I'm, I'm setting myself up for a real easy answer here, Sean. But I'm guessing... Who's your favorite? Who's best horse to you? Wingless Twilight. Oh. I don't think Twilight should have ever become an alicorn. I don't have a problem. Um, Okay. In the early days, uh, Hasbro had a game online uh, that you played on the website. And at the end of the game, Twilight becomes a princess. I mean, that was always the plan. That was Lauren's plan. That was Hasbro's plan. But there was always only supposed to be two alicorns because they are gods. They were supposed to represent all ponies. That is why they had all pony acts. I've never seen the big hang up about that. Celestia on the show has never won a fight ever. Well, okay. Originally, she was supposed to. (laughs) <laughs> well, t- yeah, well, you know, originally, Trixie was supposed to be a classmate of, tw- of Twilight's, but that might as well be headcanon now. <laughs> yeah, but, but that was the point, and it, it's like, so, Twilight not being an alicorn, I mean, that was just to sell toys. That was why Lauren was mad about it, Hasbro has admitted it, and the writers will tell you, it's like, oh, that's just been nothing but a fucking headache. You know, if she had just been get granted some sort of powers and a title and everything, that'd be one thing. But it's like, she's an alicorn, and exactly like you say, it's not like, okay, the main six act uh, as the, the agents for the Celestial Sisters. It's like, well, no, all of a sudden being an alicorn is princess, and it's like, it just muddies the... Okay, in the pilot, Celestia loses off stage. Yeah, that is funny. That- no, no, I, I could beat this from top to bottom. You give me an episode. You will never convince me that Alicorn means anything. <laughs> Show me an episode. You gotta remember that when Lauren first got this job, 
she had no idea there would even be a season two. I mean, the Discord episode was actually supposed to be the finale of season one. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, I, but Hasbro bumped it to make that the kickoff because they thought it was so strong. And that is the funny thing. When you see it, it really does seem like a summation of things rather than, okay, we're starting a new season. But that's the, the thing is that, okay, since they didn't think they were going very far, they did everything they could the first time around. So they were just all over the place. And their the continuity consisted of a 30-page double-spaced Bible, which Lauren used to have up on DeviantArt. It's, that's how thin it was. There, it was just mostly notes on how things went, but there was no great continuity. They hadn't even worked out the history. It was just because none of that was important to the show they were working on at the time. And then later, actually about season three, was when they had to start sitting down and seriously thinking out the continuity. You'll notice everything seemed to happen a thousand years ago. And more than a few fans have pointed out, it's like, wow. Well, there's a, there's a, if you've ever watched Shaolin Showdown, the, yes. the, the joke is, well, it was closer to 900 and da da da, but a thousand years ago sounds so much more regal. <laughs> I love Shaolin Showdown. Oh. The, the Shaolin Showdown was legit. I wish the the was reboot good. was yeah. garbage. Oh my god. It was, it was, it was, it, yeah, yes. it did. It was horrid. I thought it was yes. just me for a while, and I was like, it, it, am I stupid now? Did I grow up? I so know they had a reboot. Oh, you were. Yeah, in, yeah, in the reboot, there was a. Quote unquote second Omi. What? what? Yeah, what the fuck was that though? I, do. <laughs> I have no idea. He was the, if I recall, the wood dragon. You, you will not be a happy camper. I think I'll avoid it. Yep. I, I'd <laughs> watch an episode just so you could feel grateful for the old one. Sam wants to ask, and I'm going to steal it from him because I'm an asshole. Go ahead. <laughs> no good reason. What's your most proud work and what do you dislike the most? I'm curious. I'm most proud of? Most proud of and the one you dislike the most. Back in the 90s, Brian Sutton had me do the heavy lifting on writing a uh, retro future book called Eureka. That sounds and very familiar. It was a four issue mini series that Antarctic Press published. Oh, excuse me, uh, Radium Comics published it. But he, he would give me the story summation, and I went down, I did the page breakdowns, and all the scripting and the dialogue, and I think it turned out really well. You know, it's it's funny you should mention that. Don't let me forget what I was going to ask. But a lot of the, the comics I've seen you in, you seem to just do a lot of still images. I Until you brought that up, I was going to come in here. I'm like, do you have a, like, you seem resistant in a lot of issues to doing, like, well, pieces with a story. I was just curious about that. I guess I, was, I had the wrong perception. No, oh, because I'm a writer. Okay. I, I, I draw to pay the bills, but in comics I write. Yeah, no, I'm, I've, I've always been, I'm like, oh, because it's, it's very rare of the times that I've seen your work to see you write. And I was like, I thought you had an abort, uh, aversion to it for like the longest time. Well, not an aversion per se, but I like writing more. You know, back in 2005, I toiled away on fanfic.net just to get my writing chops up. I wrote a bunch of A. Arnold and Teen Titans fanfic just to, just to practice writing. Are those still up? I think they are. Well, I, I, if you could throw a link in the room, I would definitely put it in the podcast description. <laughs> uh, I think they're under King Cheetah. Mm. Now, oh, that, that, that's one more thing. Why do you keep changing your name? I'm curious about that. Back in 2000, uh, I would hang out online in Japan with a bunch of my buddies over there. And it is actually difficult for the Japanese to pronounce Sean Howell. And so I, I picked up King Cheetah as a moniker just because that was easier for them. That was when I first started using King Cheetah. And then other than that, I've only been uh, Trolly Trollenberg. And that was mostly when I was hanging out on 4chan. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this may sound a bit, uh, you know, suck up -y, But that's uh, actually, I think your art, as well as several other people's, I'm going to rattle off some names. Like I ran into people like, uh, I think this was... 2009. This was like Diego and uh, Chalo and uh, oh, and several others in Sindal, and then I saw your stuff too, and that kind of you know introduced me to the subculture. So it's like just just hearing all this just kind of takes me on a nostalgia train. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit, he saw that. Shut up, dude. <laughs> I had to. Okay, no, it's it's okay, Keen West. <laughs> and that's why I like it. I meet interesting people and get to hang out with it. In fact, in the MLP threads on 4chan, a couple of the Flash animators from the show would show up and just do Q&A with us. They were like, we're not going to give you any spoilers, but we'll tell you anything you want to know about the making of the show and how we do the puppets and everything. 
and they told us the story about the balloon because it's all the divisions within Hasbro are separated, so they're toiling away in uh, Studio B, and one of the guys from merchandising shows up with balloon toy, and he's like, do you guys think you could work this into somewhere? Because we want to <laughs> make a toy of this, and they're like, fuck that, this is great, we'll put it in the opening. <laughs> and then not only that, they used it in, I think, a total of ten episodes in season one. So it's like, oh, okay. And then later, they came up with the train, and the same thing. It's like, we'll put that in the open. Because remember, in the season one, in Over a Barrel, no, wait, not Over a Barrel. The joke was the train was train cars were actually pulled by horses. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was it was uh, Over a Barrel. Yeah. The, and, one, the one with the bisons. Yeah, and then later they got an actual train engine because Hasbro wanted to make a toy. And that's why they put that in the, the opening. And there's a uh, two little Easter eggs in the opening, but you have to squint and have a really good copy of it. To thank Fortune for all of its promotion of the show, in the last train car, there's the uh, troll face. <laughs> the it. other Easter egg is in the first train car is pony versions of Madame Foster and her old friends from Foster's home for imaginary friends. Oh, wow. That's cool. Nice. Interesting. But yeah, they they said that they got a lot of leeway, that yes, Derby was a fuck up. And there's an even worse one. If you um, if you watch Best Night Ever. Oh yeah, the one uh, the one eyed horse. <laughs> yes, the Cyclops. They were like, yeah. that was really embarrassing that that one <laughs> Yeah, that was actually a meme for a short while. They, they were kind of peeved because in those days, and we did it out of love, that guys would compile videos video montages of all the animation mistakes. Guys are like, all right, cut it out. We know we're doing the show hurry. <laughs> <laughs> to their credit, you know, later, they got much better and there were fewer mistakes, but one of their animation mistakes started creating characters because in Lesson Zero, when Twilight is having her flashback about going back to Magic Kindergarten, they fucked up and there was an alicorn foal in the class. Yeah. And wow. the, the fans leapt upon this and created Nixie, and immediately Hasbro was like, no, no, that's not an alicorn foal, it was a mistake. <laughs> there are no other alicorns aside from the, the princesses right now. Oh, okay. If I recall, there was, wasn't there a alicorn in uh, Sonic Rainbow? I think so. Uh, I don't recall. <clears throat> but if there was, it w again was a mistake. Yeah. It has to do with the nature of the uh, the 3D puppets they use to make the show. Because in the coding sometimes, you know, the, uh, especially back then, they had just these blank templates that they would just quick put together background ponies. And sometimes they would screw up and use a unicorn template and put Pegasus wings on it. Because, you know, they, again, they were trying to do this in a hurry. It was also why they would just use the clone tool and just, in crowd scenes, just stamp out the same pony. And why you will actually find derby hooves in several crowd scenes, including um, in Twilight's flashback in... Uh, Cutie Mark Chronicles, when she's a little filly watching the Summer Sun celebration, Derpy Hooves is standing in the crowd. And that's where the whole thing about Derpy being Dr. Hooves' assistant came from. Uh, so Sean, I want to get um, get on the task of um, back to um, we were asking about your, your work. Um, you were going about, um, was it Eureka you did for Antarctic Press? It was for um, Radio Comics. Oh, Radio Comics, okay. All right. Antarctic Press. And this is a secret. Way back in issue 12 of Genus, that was our lesbian unicorn issue, okay? Okay. I wrote every single story in it. I'm under three pseudonyms, but I wrote all of the stories, and I drew one of them. Oh, wow. So would that be considered your, your best work in this that's, case? Or? That's my favorite work for Antarctic Press. My favorite oh, cool. radio was uh, Eureka. Uh, the work I hate the most is I single-handedly fucked up Shantae for Way Forward. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. In 2006, I was working for Way Forward, and uh, I actually have credit on the um, Jake Long American Dragon game, but mm -hmm. Matt Boson had tapped me to do the designs for the new Shantae game. And I did all these these workups and going through some stuff, I did all this fan art and everything for him. And then my father got sick. This is 2006. And I just came to pieces. And I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't work. 
I was just beside myself and Matt was on me. It's like, I just calm down, do the turnarounds for Shantae and send them in. And I just peed it down my legs. And I half-assed this work and I just packed everything off and FedExed it to him and then the game never happened. And I have been so ashamed to this day that I screwed it up. I have never drawn Shantae since that point. Now, yeah, well, you know, you have good times and bad times in the biz. Yeah. You know, yeah speaking of the biz, like, uh, did you ever have any colleagues that just immediately inspired you? Like, favorite, like maybe artists or writers that you immediately was like, geez, this oh, is striking a fire, so. Constantly, and, <laughs> and that's the thing, you, you have, okay, you never start, stop learning, and you never stop growing. And you look at guys you work with and it's like, okay, I really like the way you did that or I really love this idea. And um, man, I couldn't even make a list. There's just so many people that I appreciate hanging out with and being friends with. And you sometimes it's just something uh, as simple as seeing how hard they work. Now, Phil, when Phil was doing Lancaster the Ghost Detective, he updated that daily as well as go to school and hold down a job. Now think about that the next time you see some lazy ass on Patreon taking, you know, a month to put out a page. You know, those are the sort of people that inspire me is when you see guys that are just into it. I mean, some guys just have the fire in their belly to draw and create and write. And those are the guys I respect because they are into it. We used to say that about Ben Dunn, that Ben Dunn would have done comics even if there was no comics business that was just always what ben was meant to do was comics and he was so dedicated to it and worked so hard at it impressive god if i would have thought that you would have been talking about ben dunn i would have started up a whole new i would have thought to, i would have prepared to talk about that more jesus big fat guy D- does he podcast <laughs> <laughs> Originally, when uh, when he started Antarctic Press, his brother Joe told me that for a brief time, they were thinking about calling the company Two Fat Guy Comics. <laughs> kind of sorry they didn't go for it. Is there a convention that you go to um, in your area where you're a guest of honor? Oh, I've never, I don't play the game. I'm yeah, I'm not very social. I don't glad hand. You know, you gotta you gotta kind of showboat and be a personality to to do that sort of thing, and I, I don't really have the time or patience for it, so. Yeah. I go to plenty of conventions and support them, but I don't worry about being the guest thing. What's the, uh, what's the worst convention you've been to? Did, did you go to uh, Las Pegasus back in the day? Oh, no. I, I played a small role in the detective work post the con, but uh, no, I didn't actually go on. <laughs> uh, worst con I've been to was uh, crap, I can't even remember the name of it. It was Anime Con up in Dallas where literally we made no money. I mean, that's never happened before that me and Brian Sutton and Leia Hernandez went up there, set up. None of these kids were spending money. Kind of like Project Day Con. It's just, it's a social event. You go there to hang out, but it's like nobody was dropping cash and we didn't even make expenses. And on top of that, you know, we're riding the dealer's table rather than enjoying the con, so we don't even have that to take away. So that was a pretty bitter experience. Have any really great conventions, conventions you want to talk about? <laughs> yeah, uh, went to the first couple of Nightmare Nights in Dallas. Both of those were a lot of fun. Enjoyed, enjoyed being there, got to hang out with people, friends with Dusty Cat and Pixel Kitties, and it was good to actually get to hang out with them. Dusty Cat's cool. Oh, yeah. I love Pixel Kitty stuff, Jesus. She's very comical. Oh. Yeah, she, her, um, Put in a good word for me. <laughs> we, we get her on here in a heartbeat. I don't know what you talk about. Art. I, I, I get her a bunch of artist co-hosts and we sit here and talk about her experiences. It'd be easy enough. You said she's comical. She does great stuff. Seems pretty open and closed. Yeah, but it's like, she's one of those people that, okay, she's in the trans community, but I don't think she wants to talk about that. Oh, no. no. That'd, that'd be, be like, like if I had Grianna talk, talk about Poland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's just, um, you talk Fallout with her, and she likes shipping uh, Twilight and Trixie, as do I. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Look, the Fallout community I had on uh, freaking Vector Brony, and he's a Fallout fan. Well, oh, guess we'll try on DA. <laughs> he got her, okay, um, my buddy Goody Rex, 
back when uh, the guys were doing the Grand Candelot Cavalcade. He had the idea because this was during the second drought. So season two is finished up. We didn't know when. Se- oh, season three was starting late because it was a short season. So we had to wait a really long time. Thank goodness it was worth the wait. Ha ha. The Goody Rex suggests, like, well, wait a minute. Why don't we do a podcast about the earlier ponies? Like, hey, that's not a bad idea. So I found a torrent on Pirate Bay, nine gigs, which was everything at that time. So it's all the Gen 1 movies, the Gen 2 movies, the series 3.5, Ponyville, all of them. And it's great. So we all got on board, including Pixel Kitties. We get there, and we're going to do Minty Destroys Christmas. And and Pixel Kitties is there, and we all all get ready to go, and we look to a Goody Rex. It's like, okay, bro, this is your show. He's like, you know, now that I look at these again, they're not that good. It's like, God damn it, this was your idea. <laughs> they're really <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah, that was the problem. It's like, okay, this seemed like a really good idea on paper, but when you actually had to slog through them, like, uh with, with, with or without, without all. Pixel Kitties was really fun on that and very gracious. So uh, as long as you can promise this will be drama-free, because she steers clear of all the... Oh, Sean, I, I was trying to keep you drama free. <laughs> Hobbs, did I try and start with this man? <laughs> oh, hey, hey, you did say, um, you did say, and I quote, I'm going to make, a, I'm going to ask this question and uh, you probably might hate it, but <laughs> otherwise, oh, I forgot, I forgot what, what that was already. <laughs> but all, otherwise, you seem to be very amicable, as it were. You kept it under. Yes. <laughs> well, you, I, I, I was stuck in call with Sean one on one for 45 minutes, and I was like, man, Hobbs going to walk away from this and be annoyed. You, you turned him into a monster. I bet he was a nice human being until he talked to you. <laughs> no. you. You rubbed off of him. Yeah. Yeah, so just ask him. Okay, cool. I appreciate that. So, anything else? Ah, oh, jeez, that was. That, that, that's going to be freaking a couple hours of editing. I, we could call it a wrap now if you want to come back as a co-host. <laughs> I guess. All right, cool. I'm going to hit stop. I'm probably 